you know, a few days ago. Uh, so essentially, if you guys aren't familiar, um, Canon is basically an on-chain interactive dispute engine implementing EVM equivalent fault proofs. Um, and so for you, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Optimism, uh, Optimism is essentially uh, an L2 being built, uh, an L2 for Ethereum. But I'll let uh, Norswap come in and uh, introduce himself and uh, tell us a little bit about optimism optimism canon and uh you know uh talk a little bit about the bug bounty so uh, i'd like to introduce them to the stage great thank you yeah so i'm Norswap. i work for optimism uh in like a research and development capacity and i'm, I'm the one currently overseeing canon which was not built by us, it was built by George Hart, which is this uh, legendary hacker. He was the first one to like jailbreak the iPhone, also hacked a, a PlayStation or two. Uh, so he, he's built this um, for us, it was like a commission, and now we're taking it over. But as part of this, we want to make sure it's really secure. And uh, something interesting is that as part of George's contract, um, we paid them we made him two payments, or we're gonna make him two payments. One is just, you know, for his work, and the second one is put in play in this bounty. So if you manage to uh, hack Canon, you will, you might get some of George money. Actually, some things are covered by George, and some things are covered by us. Um, do you want me to talk about Canon a little bit, like to just situate uh, where it fits in optimism, etc.? Yeah, sure, that'd be perfect. Yeah, I'm stoked to learn more about it. I mean, I've read all your docs, but uh, this is really revolutionary <laughs> stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, well, it's pretty fundamental stuff to optimistic rollups, right? In optimistic rollup, you have this sequencer, gets a bunch of transactions, it makes blocks on L2, which is just a separate blockchain. And then it takes uh, it, you know, take the hashes of these blocks and post them to the to Ethereum, to L1, to layer one. Uh, and so the principle of an optimistic rollup is that Optimistically, you assume that what the sequencer does is, is correct. But if you disagree, you can verify the operation of a sequencer and challenge it. And the way you do that is by reading some data from L1. There's two things you, you need to read. The first one are the transactions that were executed. And so to do that, the sequencer takes all the transactions that he executed and posts them to L1 as something called a batch. So that's your first input is batch transaction posted by the sequencer on R1. The second input are also transactions. They are deposits. So if you, you know, you're on Ethereum, you want to send some ETH over to Optimism, you need to make a deposit. And this is basically a transaction that you send on Ethereum that will be executed on Optimism. And so to execute the L2, you need the L2 native transaction. Those are the ones that are in the batches. And you need the transaction from R1. Those are the deposits. Once you have these two things, then you can do what the sequencer is doing, which is basically execute the blockchain, right? Process all the transactions, make blocks, all that good stuff. And when you do that, you make the blocks, and then you get the hash of the block, and then you can compare them to what the sequencer posted. So you're verifying what the sequencer said, basically. If you disagree, that's the interesting scenario, of course. That's where you want to challenge the sequencer and prove on Ethereum that uh, it cheated. And that's when you do a fault proof. Is everyone with me so far? Does this make sense? Or are there questions, comments? Is there a chat that we can use for this? Uh, yeah, there's a event today. channel right above this uh, where most of the, we've just been posting links um, just so far. But if, uh, hey guys, if you guys have any questions or comments or anything else or things you want to learn more about, uh, post them in the event channel and uh, we'll get to them as this discussion moves forward. Oh yeah, Pepin just tagged you in it. Yeah, so. All right, so. These, so. so these proofs are interactive. I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about the, um, the off-chain interactive component before the actual proof is submitted on-chain. Yeah, so that's the next part. Once, once you know what a fault proof is for, uh, how does it work? Well, so the, the really simple way you could do this is just rerun a whole block on Ethereum, but that's not possible because it's too costly, basically. Um, 
Well, the first system did is like, we tried to work around this by just making one block, one single transaction, and then we'll just run one transaction. It's very janky for multiple reasons that are sort of out of scope uh, to explain here. So instead, what we do is we do this fault proofing where basically you are going to run the program locally and the sequencer is going to run the program locally. And then you will compare the execution, which is like all the instructions that were executed to, to run the program. And the program, when I say program, and I mean go Ethereum, right? Get, which is the thing that is validating uh, the chain. And so the first, the start of the challenge is like, okay, you disagree on the outcome. So the question is, where do you disagree? You know, at which step of the execution do you disagree? And to do this, you do something called like the challenge game, sometimes called the bisection game, the binary search, as many names. But the idea is that, okay, you disagree on the end state and you agree on the start state because the start state is just, if you boot up Go Ethereum, it has some basic state and then you agree on the input, which is the transactions. You agree on the input because th these come from Ethereum, right? They're, these are the batches and these are the deposits. And since those are Ethereum, it's impossible to disagree on them. So, so you agree on the start, you disagree on the end. And so what you will do is that you will look in the middle, basically. You will look at, so the challenger will say, I think the you know, Go Ethereum takes 10,000 steps to execute or something like that. And so you will look at the 5,000th transaction and you will run your get. It's like a modified version. You will run it for 5,000 um, did I say transaction? I mean instructions. You'll run it for 5,000 instructions. And then you will take a snapshot of the memory of the program at that stage. And you will make a hash of that and you'll send it to a chain. And so the challenger will say, well, I think at, at 5,000 instructions, here's the, the state of the memory. And then the defender, so basically the sequencer that initially posted the thing, will say, well, either I agree, I agree that this is the state at, at, the, at the half, or I disagree. I think no. I think the state of the program is different at this step. Based on that, so either you agree or you disagree. If you agree, you will look at half of the remaining portion of the program. So from the 5,000 to 10,000 instruction, and you will do the same thing again. You will look at the you know 7,500 instruction. If you disagree, it means that you disagree before, and so you will do the opposite. You will look between the zero and the 5,000 transaction, you'll look at the 2,500 transaction. And then you continue this process each time you cut the possible state of where you disagree in half until you head up a single transaction that you disagree with. So basically, you both agree that the memory before executing this instruction is the same, but you disagree on the state of the memory after executing this instruction. All right, I'm going to pause here for questions. Yeah, we've got two questions from the community. Um, although I th think one of these should probably go for later. One is that, uh, how does the pre-image oracle work during the interactive challenge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good is, for later. Yep, and the other question is, uh, what is the attack surface here? Uh, where should we start looking for bugs? Um, hmm, I mean, I <laughs> it's sort of also getting ahead. But basically, we've modified Go Ethereum to be able to do all these things that I'm describing. And uh, so one of the, yeah, I guess I'll answer that later as part of my explanation. So maybe we can like, keep that in store. I think that would be easier instead of like getting things out of order. I see someone ask a uh, very simple question, which is like, what is the sequencer? Is that contract? Sequencer is a Go Ethereum node that we use to uh, basically run the L2 chain. So the L2 chain, you can think of it as just the same thing as the L1 chain, so the same thing as Ethereum. The difference is that we have like a single node, and in the future we'll have a few nodes um, that process it. But otherwise, it runs exactly the same, the same way as Ethereum. You know, there's like the EVM. Uh, you, you send transactions, they get processed, uh, blocks are being created, all that. 
Uh, someone said it sounds centralized. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the whole point. The whole point of uh, a a uh, you know a roll up solution is that it's centralized in a sense. Um, the sequencer is centralized. Oh, in the future, there'll be a few of them. But the idea is that you can there are really few actors. So you can require very very powerful hardware. You can run the thing in a big data center, and then you submit it on Ethereum, and there you know that it's correct because if it's incorrect, someone will challenge it. And so the security uh, assumption is that there will always be one honest person that is able to validate the chain. So besides the sequencer, I should have said that, there's also a bunch of validators who are just reproducing what the sequencer is doing by taking the inputs from Ethereum, rerunning them, getting the hash, and then comparing to what the sequencer submitted. And as long as there's a single one of those, Right, so this is a much weaker assumption, right? Like Ethereum, you need to have 50% of valid uh, of honest actors. With a, a rollup, you only need the one. Okay, I think that does answer the, the questions. Okay, so let's get forward so that we can answer the interesting questions about the attack surface and everything. So you play the challenge game, you find a single uh, instruction you disagree on, and then you actually execute that on chain. We have like a, a MIPS. So basically, I've, I've been talking about instructions. The way we do this is we compile uh, Geth or mini Geth or, or, or special version to this instruction set called MIPS. MIPS is not really special. The idea is that it's very simple to implement a MIPS interpreter. And so we have a, this MIPS interpreter on chain, which we use to run this single instruction of the disagreement. And then based on uh, the result of that, we can say, well, the sequencer was right or the challenger is right. And so that's the, that's the process at a high level. So to make all this possible, I already gave away that we need to compile uh, the special version of Geth to MIPS. So that's something that needs to happen. And so what's, what's this uh, special version of Geth? It's basically, uh, we just took, you know, the upstream go Ethereum geth. We removed a bunch of stuff that we don't need to validate. So we don't need a RPC server. We don't need a real database. We don't need a bunch of stuff. So we removed all of that. And we replaced the database with something called the pre-image oracle. So this is the this is the tricky part of Canon. So basically to to validate normally, you execute transactions. You need to access the transactions. That's the first input that you need. And the second input that you need um, is the EVM state, right? You need to know what's in the EVM state. And all of these things are being committed to on Ethereum. So you, you know, within on Ethereum, on the EVM, you can access the block hash. And the block hash does commit to the Um, I was gonna say, yeah, it does commit to you know the whole history of the chain and the current uh, L1 state, so the state of Ethereum. And with that, you can prove the deposit and the batches. So you can prove all the transactions. So that's the first thing that you need. So I don't know if you're familiar with Merkle proofs, but that's the technology being used there. Use Merkle proof to prove that the deposits are indeed uh, what you say they are and that the transaction in the batches are what you say they are. And the second thing you need to access is the state, but it's the L2 state. And that you get from basically a previous assertion. So, you know, the sequencer regularly, it, it posts uh, ashes of L2 blocks. And each time you make a new, uh, a new assertion, it will be, it will build upon the previous one. And so you can use that previous um, assertion to access the L2 state because you assume that that's indeed correct. And the reason you assume this is that if you didn't agree with that one, then the challenger should always challenge the oldest uh, assertion that he disagrees with. Otherwise, it makes sense. 
Okay, that's a lot. Um, and I should say that I'm describing the, <laughs> the future behavior, not the current behavior. So I'm, I'm describing the behavior for layer two, and that's not entirely what's implemented right now. Uh, but I think describing that will help you get like what's the what's the goal, and that's pretty important. I'll, I'll put some questions again. Yeah. Oh, so I have my own question. Can you talk a little bit about how the economics of this whole system work out, works out? You know, what's the incentive for the validator to challenge, and what prevents a validator from simply spamming challenges to slow down the whole L2? Uh, so the economics of it, which is not something that's actually implemented currently, so just to, to highlight that, is that there will be a bond, and so the sequencer will have to, to post a very large bond. Um, and so, you know, it's like, you know, a bunch of ETH that you post in a contract. And if someone manages to successfully challenge something he said, you will lose uh, all that deposit, that bond. The reason it needs to be large is that the, you know, the incentive for the sequencer to cheat can be pretty large because there's so much money on the L2 chain. Uh, if you rugged all of it, that's a ton of money. And so the, the penalty must be high enough. For him to never attempt that. Uh, the challenger also will need to post a bond. Otherwise, indeed, they will uh, they can they can grieve the the, the defender because the, the way this will work, and this is also not the way it works currently. Uh, but the way this will work is that if there is a challenge, and the sequencer or whoever defends for the sequencer does not answer the challenge succeeds by default, right? Otherwise, it's easy. Someone challenges you, just don't answer, and then no worries. So by default, if a challenge is not being answered, he wins. That means that a challenger can impose cost, costs on the defender, right? Because he needs to make transaction to answer. And so that's not great if, if the challenge is bogus. And so the challenger also needs a, a small bond, basically only big enough to pay for the transaction cost from the defender, basically. So it's disincentivized to, to spam. That answer it? Yeah, totally does. So um, is there some room here for white hats who specialize in uh, like game theoretic modeling to review that kind of thing? Not really. Uh, the reason is that currently uh, all this is not implemented. Um, and so the, the challenge contract is basically a dummy which has this thing called the honest challenger, uh, honest defender, sorry, assumption, which is that we assume so there's no bond at all for nobody. Uh, there is like a, a prize if you want. I will explain that uh, in, in a sec. And we assume that defender is honest and always answers. The reason it's set up that way uh, which is a bit weird, is that the original idea was is that we were going to upload these contracts to the L1 chain. And people would have been able to play with these contracts directly. And if they were able to challenge, to successfully challenge a block, then they would have gotten the reward that we would have put in the contract. We ended up not doing that, and that's for uh, a few reasons. One big reason is that we expanded the, sc the scope, right? So the what this thing allows you to do, this, this like thing where you, if you challenge, you get the prize, is that it, it allows you to show that you can challenge blocks that should not have been challengeable. Then you get a prize. But we also wanted to uh, give you a prize if you found blocks that were wrong but could not be challenged. And that's not possible if you deploy on the L1 chain. I have more to say, but I'll, I'll, I speak too much. I'll do a pause for questions and comments. Someone asked, um, could the challenger spam continuously? Uh, so continuously challenging and not mentioning sequence format. So no, they can't do that because they will have to pay a bond. I mean, in the final versions, which is not the version that the, the bounty is for, but in the final version, they will not be able to do that because there is a bond. And the bond basically pays for the uh, defender costs. So they could, in a sense, you know, what they could do is impose a very high upfront cost because this, the defender only recoups the cost when the challenge is co completed. But in practice, the, 
the defender is going to be like optimism or some other similarly like fairly well off entity that can afford like a data center and a bunch of things. So probably it's not a very feasible attack. All right, so. Uh, so if we're gonna, so if we're not looking at the, the economic modeling, um, what's the attack surface that White Hats should start uh, learning about and reviewing? All right, so it's mostly to do with Geth. I think I'll, I'll do a parenthesis here and, and explain sort of the difference between what I've been like presenting and what's actually implemented. So what I've been presented is a way to to uh, to verify L2 blocks, right? To verify the sequencer is a nest and, and does this work. What is currently in scope for the repo, uh, for the bug bounty, and what's implemented in repo is the same thing, but it's for L1 blocks instead. So that then makes things kind of different because L1 blocks are posted on L1 chain. Well, you know they're valid because they've been through a theorem consensus, right? So normally, it's impossible to challenge anything because everything is valid by definition. And that's why the original contract would give you a price if you manage to challenge anything. We also want to give you money if you manage to show that you could create a L1 block that could be posted on chain um, and that we could not challenge it. Wait, that doesn't make sense. Um, okay, where, where you show that if you were, if there were some magic, say you control 50% or 60% of the, the hash rate and you posted a, a wrong L1 block, then the system that's currently implemented will not be able to challenge it. That's the second uh, big victory condition for this. OK, so let me answer the question about the attack surface. So all this is implemented through uh, this program called Minigeth, which is a, a stripped down version of, of Geth, which does implement this uh, pre-image oracle. And so the way it works is that you basically run this program. And at some point, it needs to access the inputs, right? So either the transactions, the batches, the deposits, and sometimes it needs to access the L2 state. The way that normal get does this is that it gets all this information from either you know the transaction that you submitted or from uh, the database that's stored on disk. Uh, here, you don't have database on disk. And so instead of going to the database, you go to this thing called the pre-image oracle. So here, also where things get tricky, is that many guests can run in two modes. All right, there is the mode that is compiled to MIPS, which is what will be like the object of the challenge game. And this mode, in this mode, the pre-image oracle gets the... Well, actually, there's also two modes for that. So there's actually three implementations of the pre-image oracle, depending on what you do. In the... So when you run Minigeth on your disk, in, uh, on your disk, I mean locally, and it's compiled to MIPS, you get the images from your disk, and uh, they're there because you, you fetched them previously. So you need to prefetch all the images you might need, and then the preimage oracle will just read from there. This prefetching, is done by running Minigef, and there it doesn't matter that, that it's in MIPS or just compiled for your normal uh, PC architecture. And there, the pre-image oracle is implemented by simply querying another, another node. And so it will just uh, you know, query infra for the, for the pre-images. Because these pre-images, they, they tend to be like uh, L1 state nodes, basically. So that's you know one mode is you the pre-image oracle queries infra. One mode is the pre-image oracle queries things on disk, which are actually the thing that have been fetched from infra before and that you saved. So this in the if you read the documentation, this is called prefetch mode, the, the first one. Then there is a mini get in MIPS. So this in the in the repo is called MIPCVM. MIPCVM is actually a program that takes the compiled Minigeth binary in MIPS and executes it. 
That's why it's called MIPCVM. So that one reads the thing on your desk that were fetched by the, by the prefetch mode. And then the third implementation is the one that runs on chain, but only ever um, execute a single instruction. But this single instruction might be an access to the pre-image oracle. And in that case, uh, you will have needed to supply also the pre-images in advance. So before doing your challenge, or a step in your challenge, I mean, the, the last step, you will have to the contract, there is a, a function where you can su uh, submit pre-images, basically. Um, and so the attack surface is basically making sure that all this stuff, you know, like all these three modes of Minigaf do the same thing, because if they diverge, that's when you get attack scenarios. All right, let me pause again. So, so we might be going as deep as like uh, the Go MIPS compiler. Oh yeah, indeed. Um, I've been in contact with people uh, trying to do things on this on this bounty, and there was someone that was basically fuzzing, so trying a bunch of inputs and seeing if the um, result they got. Uh, when when using Minigaf uh, compiled to MIPS and Minigaf not compiled to MIPS, compiled to like x64, which is the usual thing that people use, uh, were the same. And uh, funnily enough, he, he found something, but in, it ended up not being exploitable. Uh, because what he found is that in uh, GAF, there are some functionalities, and th this was a like crypto primitive, like some kind of... Uh, hash or uh, encryption function that's implemented differently depending on the target architecture. So for MIPS, it's implemented one way, for x64, it's implemented another way. Um, and so it behaved differently. In one case, the implementation panicked, and in the other one, it didn't. But it turned out that George had updated that uh, code for mini-GAF. So, so that guy was like fuzzing the you know, actual GAF. And so it wasn't exploitable in Canon. But so, yeah, you, you, you may have to go there. So the core of this uh, new Canon bug bounty is, to, to reiterate, making sure that the three different operating modes of Minigeth perfectly match. Yes. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. Like the core is really like, there's all these L1 blocks. You should never be able to challenge one. If you manage to find, to, you know, to craft some input that makes it, that makes a challenge of an L1 block succeed, something is wrong in the system, right? Because these went through a term consensus, so they're correct, and so our system should agree with that. And similarly, if something is not valid according to a term consensus, then our system should be able to challenge it. And if not, it's broken. This is the fundamental guarantee, and that's what we're looking to break. But indeed, like sort of the most obvious way to do that is uh, is, is that you know Ethereum consensus runs through get and get uh, is compared to x64. If the you know version compiled to MIPS behaves differently and gives different results for the execution, then of course then you'll be able to challenge because then you will get a different result at the end. And so that, you know, that's a very obvious way to, uh, to try to attack that problem. Awesome. Well, I'm stoked. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's started to take in. Uh, it took me a while also. Uh, so yeah, if, if anybody has any questions. Uh, I can tell you, so the, the bounty might seem short, right? That, um, it's only uh, running through the seventh, but I've been in touch with someone, and someone actually found a bug that should have submitted it today. And as a result of that, we're probably going to extend, you know, I still need to review it uh, thoroughly, but it seems legit. And so as a result of that, it's very possible that we're going to extend the bounty for another month. So you will have time to, you know, to look in depth. Right. 
you have any more community questions? Did we, did we uh, adequately answer the question of how the pre-image oracle works? Uh, maybe I could add some uh, color there, I guess. Well, yeah, so basically, you know, if you're familiar with the way Go Ethereum works, which I guess is not maybe many people, but when you, when in the EVM, you want to read some state, you will basically hit a, a, the database of Go Ethereum. And the way that works is that you traverse a Merkle, Merkle tree. And, you know, every node of Merkle tree is a hash of its children. And so you traverse all the, the nodes in the tree until you get to the leaf. Um, basically, we, we reuse that because at each step, you want to access the, you know, you have the address of, uh, of the, the node that you want. And that address is basically a hash of the children. So if you want to access the children, well, you need a pre-image. That's why it's called a pre-image oracle, right? You, get, you give it a hash, you get the pre-image, of the hash and the pre-image of the hash is the thing that if you hash it gives you the hash. So as long as you have these uh, hash to pre-image bindings, then you can do exactly the same thing you could do with the database. In, in fact, the database is mostly like not 100%, but like maybe 97% of the guest database is essentially a pre-image oracle if you, if you try to think like that. Um, the, the other thing that we need pre-images for are uh, the deposits and the batches to prove them against the L1 block to show that indeed in the chain history we had these batches uh, occur. But th this is for only for L2, so uh, for L1, which is what's implemented currently, you don't need that. You, you do need though the, the L1 transactions themselves, right, which are also committed in the in the block. So you you will need to you know sometimes. You, when validating a block, you need to execute transactions. You actually need to know what the transaction is. So it's possible that the single point of disagreement is like reading a transaction in a block. In that case, the, the pre-image into supply is, is the, um, you know, the, the pre-image for uh, the Merkle try that commits to all the transaction in the block hash. Is that, does that clarify a bit? Yeah, get export pre-images. That would be a good one. Yeah. So yeah, if you're not familiar with all that, I, I really recommend spending some time looking at how uh, you know guesswork and Ethereum works in general. Um, if you've never like had a look at the yellow paper, that can be useful, although it's a bit dry. But there are a bunch of explainers. I think I'll try to find there's a really great like huge diagram, which is a um, uh, you know a visualization of how Ethereum works at least as of you know proof of work. And if you you know can understand all the parts of this diagram, then you should be good to go. Yeah, I have to agree. The, the yellow paper is a great starting point if you're looking at, you know, how the innards of Ethereum work and, you know, if you wanted to validate a block from scratch, what would you need to know? Yep. Yeah, I'm trying to find this diagram. I'm sure it's not far. Uh, yeah, there, I got it. Any other questions while he's searching for the diagram um, or anything you guys want to clarify or want to take a look into, uh, just throw it in the event channel. Uh, we're keeping an eye on it. There it is. I'm posting it in the event channel. Perfect. But yeah, like understanding Merk Merkle try is definitely like a big you know, like it, it's a must for, for this bug bounty, I think.
Um, you can, you know, also look through the repo to understand what's going on. Uh, George already made a bunch of tests, and so one of the things he did is to test all the upcodes, all the MIPS upcodes, make sure they run the same on chain and off chain. Um, so that's an interesting thing it does. Uh, I can tell you that. So probably what's going to happen if, if this uh, bug that normally has been submitted, I actually, actually realize I don't have the immune file access on the bug bounty, but we're looking into that at the moment. Uh, I think I just need to be granted them. Uh, if the bug checks out, uh, so probably we'll suspend the bounty for like, you know, a couple of days. So basically what happened is that we need to ascertain the bug is correct and uh, fix it, right? And then the bounty will resume from this fixed state. But uh, basically, what, what this guy did to find the bug was simply to just run, um, you know, run uh, what's called cannon against the recent blocks, right? and that that turned up some problems. Uh, this, this guy was doing fuzzing, so like this approach, we just uh, throw a bunch of stuff at Canon and see if it breaks. Uh, those are interesting approaches. Yeah, so the someone in the event channel uh, said that make sure to stay up to date with the new developments uh, that make, you know, make your life easier. So I've, I've added some, you know, the the scope for bounty is a specific comment in the repo, but I've, I've made a bunch of uh, pushes, mostly documenting things. Um, although so far, it's just science agent, which should not be the, the part that you're concerned about the most. Uh, and, and someone asked about like automated challenger defender agents. So that's not, that's not done yet. Um, realistically, maybe in a few weeks, but I don't think it's going to happen this week or next week. If someone wants to contribute this agent, because it shouldn't be very difficult. So we have these uh, these scripts, these demo scripts. It's also a great way to to sort of see what's going on in the system. And that's something I've cleaned up in the head of the repo. So, you know, don't look at the commit that's in scope. Look at the, you know, the main GitHub page. And these scripts are a great place to store also. Uh, and from this script, it should be very easy to, you know, write an automated challenger defender. All right. Are there any more questions? Yeah, just want to see if there's any more questions from the community. Um, again, this has been fairly insightful, at least on my end, at least for my non-technical expertise. Um, so we got another question for you asking if there are any other projects that are doing something similar. Yes. Well, uh, the big one's Arbitrum, right? This is, um, very similar to what Arbitrum is doing. Um, their system has evolved a little bit differently, and they're also rewriting it. So they currently have a, a challenge, like I just described, you know, like a, a bisection game where you just try to find a single point of disagreement and then execute that. I'm not sure exactly how it works for them currently. I think maybe like you find a single instruction in disagreement, but maybe not. I'm not sure. But they're rewriting it to be very similar to Canon, um, but they're going to use WebAssembly instead of MIPS, for instance. That's just one different difference. Um, yeah, so for us, like this system is coupled with another update, which we call Bedrock. And so B Bedrock is basically a from scratch redesign that's much, much simpler, much cleaner. It enables much lower fees. And it's all based on the possibility of, of doing Canon, basically. So it's, it's because we have Canon that we're able to do this clean design. 
which uh, is as simple as possible. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Arbitrum does not really publicize their plan much. I mean, they do like sort of at a high level describe it, but there's no like repo uh, of ongoing development you can check. So it's, it's kind of difficult to know what they will end up. It sounds similar to, to what we're doing, but you know, we'll see, I guess. But they, they do have a challenge game currently. Yeah. Although I do think there's a lot of historical baggage in there, uh, you know, sort of the way things have evolved. Awesome. Uh, just want to give it another few minutes, see if we can answer a few more of your guys' questions. If not, then uh, we can, you know, close this out. So, I mean, if anything, oh, we got one from 242 asking, what is an RLP reader? Uh, RLP stands for recursive length prefix. Uh, it's an encoding scheme used pretty extensively throughout uh, the Ethereum standard. Uh, so the RLP reader decodes uh, a byte stream of RLP encoded data into a sequence of uh, lists or integers or bytes or lists of integers and bytes. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think like, this is just a good uh, Ethereum interface to, to do that. Yeah, yeah to if implement you the formal specification of uh, recursive length prefix, definitely read the yellow paper. Yeah, that's a good, uh, it's actually fairly well explained in there. I agree. I, had to imp I implemented it once. It's uh, <laughs> a very annoying thing to implement. It's one of these cases where the formal definition is much simpler than the implementation. Yeah, I, I can say that um, I have seen RLP encoding and decoding implemented wrong several times uh, in critical severity bug reports. So definitely look there. Although it should be said that normally this is code from uh, Go Ethereum, right? So you wouldn't expect it to contain a bug. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if it's if it's straight from from Go Ethereum, probably right. Uh, you know what? I will give you guys um, something that should be useful, which is a diff from the um, uh, how's it called? You know, from the so basically George forked um, uh, Go Ethereum one dot ten dot eight. If memory serves, I think that's it. And made a bunch of changes on top of that. And I've been working on a, um, you know, basically rebooting everything in a Git history that shows the changes, which currently is, is not easy to see from the Canon repo. Uh, it, it might include changes I've done myself, but normally I shouldn't have changed anything semantically meaningful. Um, so, you know, there's that caveat. Let's see. I know there's a GitHub feature to compare branches, but let's see. I'll mini guess. Well, anyway, I will link this. So you have the branches and you have L1 mini geth is what like the you know the bounty is about plus uh, or minus a few modifications I made and then you get L1 mini geth base I'm gonna write this down which is the commit at which George forked um, go Ethereum and so the diff between these two branches basically give you all the changes that is made um, to to go Ethereum so that should be useful. I'm pretty sure there's a way to see this. Ah, oh, wait, wait. Actually, another thing I can give you guys um, is that there's some, you know, there's an explanation on the on this wiki. We have another repo about Canon. 
Uh, so we'll link that here. And I have this page called mini get three bays, and this has linked to the diffs. Um, This is how, this is the dish. So that should prove useful. How would one know if I know enough programming for smart contract audits? Uh, <laughs> well, this is not much about smart contracts, more about like mostly Go. There is a, a small contract component. Uh, especially like on the, the MIPS, uh, on-chain MIPS implementation. Uh, but yeah, I do, I do believe this is, a, as far as Bounty goes, this is a fairly advanced one. On the flip side, you know, uh, if you don't know Solidity, but you do know Go, uh, this is your opportunity here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, th this is how I started in the blockchain space. Like, like uh, last year, I didn't know anything about it, and um, like applied to this uh, Ethereum apprenticeship thing, which they used to recruit people from you know outside of crypto to work on crypto infrastructure. So I really started like on the deep end on directly infrastructure, and uh, that was sort of where I was coming from. So for me, it was a great starting point. Uh, yeah, Ethereum apprenticeship is still it's still running. They have done a couple. I think they're on the third instantiation. Uh, I don't know what they they plan with that. Uh, or the second one. This is about the second one. Um, but if they do more, it will be uh, announced on the Ethereum Foundation blog. So you should subscribe to that to to get info on it. Got another question asking, what would be the main concept to grasp uh, within smart contracts, uh, oracles, et cetera? Do, I guess, do you have any insight on that? Like for this bounty specifically, right? I would be bounty specific, but I guess Dr. G, if you want to clarify. Oh, he said in general. Uh, <laughs> well. I'm not actually like a big like a uh, smart contract person. I haven't written all that much in my life, so it's kind of hard to tell. But I can give you some opinions. Um, things that we see wrong most often: um, using bad oracles when you're integrating with a decentralized exchange, uh, using a bad random number generator on chain. Um, you know, not setting your slippage when making trades. Um, having uh or missing access modifiers you know just completely open access control uh people failing to properly initialize their uups proxy implementations um yeah i think a sort of a general list of the the common things we see done wrong re-entrancy like that's the list oh yeah yeah definitely re-entrancy um oh um uh token integrations like uh, there's all sorts of weird uh, tokens like tokens with multiple addresses, deflationary tokens, rebasing tokens, uh, tokens where decimals is equal to zero, all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, that's wild. Decimals equals to zero. Yeah, the um, the USDT thing. Sorry, TUSD thing. Uh, tokens with multiple addresses uh, was the source of that recent. Um, security advisory in compound finance. Definitely go ahead and read about that one if you're interested in uh, you know, what goes wrong when uh, tokens act strangely. You guys hear about the run-in hack? 
Axie like Infinity oh, yeah. thing. Seems like the biggest hack ever, like 620 million, something like that. You know, I've stopped keeping track because it goes <laughs> up like every couple of weeks. Well, the previous one was like this multi chain thing, but yeah, the hacker like reimbursed most of it, I guess. Uh, with the multi chain thing, the one with permit? I don't remember, but the one the one that was six uh, six hundred million, the previous one. No, it was you know something like multi chain or chain market or any chain. I don't remember one of the one of the, <laughs> those names. Yeah. Poly market? No, wait. Poly chain or poly market? I think. Okay. Yeah, because there there was a there was a big vuln that never got exploited because uh, our friends at the um, at Daydob. Uh, found it and responsibly disclosed it before it could be exploited. But that would have been a big one. I think, uh, Adrian, do you remember how much funds was at risk there? Was it over 800 million? Yeah. Trend's not there. Yeah, it's okay. Poly Network. That was the big yeah. one. Poly, poly Network. You know, just goes yeah. to show that, um, you know, bug bounties really do work, uh, big ones work, and that uh, Optimism is taking their users' security very seriously. For sure, for sure. I mean, we do have a, a small record, too, at Optimism. We paid the biggest uh, bug bounty ever. So. Oh, yeah. Yep. Two million forty-two thousand. No, two million and forty-two dollars. <laughs> yes, was, right. Always with the forty-two. The forty-two makes it the biggest, so it's kind of important. <laughs> right. Yeah. But yeah, that one was a great find as well. Also from yeah. a uh, an old 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 hand at uh, hacking iPhones. Yeah, he's a friend of George. Yeah. What is George. it about iPhones and optimism? Yeah, I think it might have been, you know, tipped by George to take a look at this. Like, like the association drew, drew him, which is great. Uh, okay. Makes sense. The 10 million is the, is it for wormhole? War, the wormhole, the, difficult to say with my accent. Yeah, there's, there's two. Uh, one for MakerDAO. So if you've ever used DAI, uh, they have a $10 million bounty on anyone who can break DAI. And then, yes, also for Wormhole. Yeah, there was a, a colleague of mine at Optimism started looking at um, the wor Wormhole bounty. Uh, he says, like, they do very fishy stuff in Solana land. Like, they have a custom code generator that's entirely undocumented. And he said... Something there's got to be wrong. <laughs> but you should well, look at that. You should look at the Canon Dog Bounty. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Much more future impact. You know, less money, but it's like securing the future of Ethereum. So yeah, that. And the bragging rights are nice and big. Yep. Stole George Hot's money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want him coming after me, though. Uh, he's, all right. he's, he's a nice guy with very yeah. spicy opinions, but, uh, you know, it's fair game. Oh yeah, something else I wanted to say is that 
if, you know, you're investigating this and you have questions, you want to get some details, something you don't understand, uh, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll be happy to, you know, answer your questions. What's the best way to reach out? Uh, would it be here on Discord or Telegram or something else? Probably, probably Discord is, is the best. Um, but you can do Telegram, is that's where you chat to people most often. I'm like Norswap pretty much everywhere, so it's easy to find me. Nice. So if you guys got any questions, uh, you can hit up, hit them up on Telegram. <laughs> Also at the same username as his Discord, which is at Norswap, pretty much. Yep. Uh, avoid Twitter because somehow I never get notification when I get, you know, message requests. So I often find out like a, a week later. <laughs> cool. Uh, if you guys don't have anything else, um, I mean, we're right on the dot. Uh, we can wrap this up. Uh, if you guys have any additional questions beyond what was discussed or something that pops into your mind or head um, after this call is finished, uh, feel free to send them a note. Uh, again, Discord, Telegram seems to be his, uh, or he's, he claims are his uh, best channels to reach him at. Um, so feel free to send them a note. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll leave this open for a little bit longer. Uh, if you need to hop off, feel free to hop off. Um, you know, if you want to stick around and uh, great, nice. <laughs> how, do, how, do, how do people claim that uh, incredibly awesome POAP? Oh, uh, I don't think I made a POAP for this one. It was just a, a, a front-end image for this one. Um, oh, never mind. My bad. So you're getting, you're getting everybody's hopes up uh, for the POAP. Um, yeah, we, we were kind of a little bit uh, stretched on time, Duncan, for, for this one, so we didn't get a chance to put together a, a POAP for it, but... My apologies. I'm sorry for getting everybody's hopes up. <laughs> now you're, you're going to get me uh, my DMs flooded again. <laughs> but if you if you manage to, you know, actually find a bug, I'm pretty sure I can get um Kelvin to make you a uh a NFT. So it's my colleague at Optimism, he does Andron NFTs. It's all bound, so you can't you can't flip it. But it's like, you know, a badge of pride. That's what uh that's what, all, that's what the NFTs are all about. <laughs> that's what they should be. <laughs> Cool. So I'll stick around. Uh, uh, if you guys need to hop off, feel free to hop off. I appreciate you guys coming on. It's always a pleasure uh, speaking with uh, the community, Duncan, Norswap. Appreciate you guys, you know, hopping on and, uh, you know, driving the conversation. Yeah, well, thank you very much for, uh, for having me and uh, getting this in front of people. And not and, a problem. Uh, yeah, great time. Well, I'll up off because I have some place to be. But uh, yeah, see you all around, hopefully. Yep. And, uh, yeah, good. Fun. All right. Thank you so much.